Hi all, today we're going to be looking at Michael Drayton and his Sonnet 61, known as Love's Farewell. Now Michael Drayton was a well-known poet of his time, and he was a regular in the court of Queen Elizabeth at a time when England was becoming a very powerful nation. She died in 1603, and unfortunately for him, James I wasn't a great supporter of his writing. Um, but nevertheless, even though he wasn't in court, he continued to write quite a lot. And some of his contemporaries were great writers. If you look at some of the names, they're John Donne, Samuel Daniel, Philip Sidney, and of course, the one that everybody will know, the master William Shakespeare. He also had a benefactor, Sir Henry Goodyear, and this sonnet could have been inspired by a real person, a certain Anne Goodyear, who was the oldest daughter of the, his benefactor, Sir Henry Goodyear. Also, furthermore, he numbered his sonnets, and this one is number 61 in that sequence. All right, let's read Sonnet 61. Since there's no help, come let us kiss and part. Nay, I have done, you get no more of me. And I am glad, yea, glad with all my heart, that thus so cleanly I myself can free. Shake hands forever, cancel all our vows. And when we meet at any time again, be it not seen in either of our brows, that we one jot of former love retain. Now at the last gasp of love's latest breath, when his pulse failing, passion speechless lies, when faith is kneeling by his bed of death, and innocence is closing up his eyes. Now, if thou wouldst, when all have given him over, from death to life thou mightst him yet recover. Now, most Elizabethan sonnets are written in 14 lines that are each 10 syllables long. But what Michael Drayton has done in this poem is that line 13 has got 12 syllables, while line 14 has got 11 syllables. So he's messed around a little bit with the form of the sonnet over there, just for experimentation. And also with Elizabethan sonnets, we know that it is written normally in three quatrains and a rhyming couplet. Okay, so we can see that through the use of the rhyme scheme, which clearly indicates the quatrains and the couplet. And if you recall, in an Elizabethan sonnet or Shakespearean sonnet, um, each quatrain deals with the theme in a slightly different way, which we'll discuss as we get into the poem. Now, as we get into the first two quatrains of the poem, we see that the first quatrain is mostly about the speaker it's himself. We see the use of the first person pronoun I and me. Okay? He's happy here in this quatrain to have parted cleanly from his lover because of the sense of freedom that it's going to bring. All right, we can talk about the freedom in a moment. In the second quatrain, he reinforces this idea of a permanent severance. Okay, And he focuses on the two of them in this one we see pronouns such as we and our over there. And now the tone that we see in these first two quatrains is also very decisive and dismissive of his former lover. We also see the use of imperative mood in those lines over there. In other words, he's almost giving a command to his lover of how she should act in the circumstance with the breaking off of the relationship. Now, as we get into line one, we can see line one says, since there's no help, come, let us kiss and part. Now, this first section here that says, since there's no help, basically means that there's no saving the relationship. Okay, So because of that, he says, let us just kiss and part. In other words, it's almost like he's looking for this very easy way of parting from his lover. Okay, He's wanting to break off the relationship with the lover. But now, one has to ask oneself here, if he wants to break things off cleanly, why is he asking for a kiss? Because a kiss is a rather intimate action. So we'll see later in the poem that he obviously does rethink this. And I think this is the first little moment in the poem where we can actually see that he's not really possibly that serious about this clean break over there. Moving into line two, he says, Nay, I have done. You get no more of me. Now this word nay here, seems to be a response to an interjection by his lover. In other words, she possibly said something to him to try and argue with him, and he replies with this nay, which means no. 
He says, I have done, you get no more of me. In other words, she won't have any more of his affection. In other words, for him, everything's over. He goes on to say that I'm glad, yea, glad with all my heart. Notice the repetition over there of the word glad, just to emphasize how glad he is to be free of that relationship. Once again, I think one needs to be asking here how honest the speaker's being. Is he really glad with all his heart that he can so cleanly break free from this relationship? In other words, he believes it's possible to break off this relationship so cleanly. Now, of course, as most people know, it's very difficult to just break something off that cleanly. Now, as we move into the second quatrain, we see this action of shaking hands forever, cancelling all our vows. Okay? Now, shake hands forever. Now, think of the difference between a shake of a hand and the kiss that he mentioned earlier. So he's moved from this kiss to shaking hands. And, of course, the shaking of a hand is a much more platonic type of action over here. It's not as intimate as the kiss. He also says, cancel all our vows. In other words, all promises that they made to each other with regards to their relationship are not necessarily relevant anymore. And he goes on to say, and when we meet at any time again, be it not seen on either of our brows that we want jot a former love retain. In other words, if they meet any time again, okay, if they see each other after breaking things off, it mustn't be seen in either of their brows. Okay, Their brows would be their faces, so the expressions mustn't show that they retain or keep one little bit, a jot is a little bit, of their former love. So you can see here that in these two trains is really trying to break things off and trying to show that there can be no emotion, no looking back, no regrets for the breaking off of this relationship. Now as we get into the third quatrain and then the rhyming couplet of the sonnet, we'll see that the third quatrain rests on the personification of love as someone that's busy dying. Now, of course the speaker has just broken things off with his lover so the Love between them is busy dying. But also everything that goes along with that is gone. The passion, the faith, and the innocence that goes along with love are all gone. Now in our couplet we see a volta or a turnabout or a sudden change in the speaker's thinking. And the speaker urges the lover to revive the love and to bring um, that love back to life. And of course this makes one question the first two quatrains. Was the lover being serious or honest when he said that he wanted to break things off so cleanly. Now in that first line of the third quatrain, you'll see that there's the repetition of the owl sound over there, last, loves, and latest. Love, of course, is personified here as a, a person dying. And we see here that with the last gasp, in other words, the very last breath, such as latest breath. And we see that with the pulse that is failing over here. Now, of course, pulse failing means the heart's about to stop. It's slowing down and it's stopping. I think one needs to realize or be cognizant of the symbolism of the heart over here. Heart is not just the life force of the body, and when it stops, a person does, but the heart is also a symbol of love. Then we have passion, which is personified, which is lying speechless, unable to talk. And of course, if someone's speechless, you can read into that that it's possibly shocked at this, okay? Unable to come to grips with what's happening. Then we have faith that is personified as kneeling by love's bed of death, okay? So this is, of course, linking to the love that's busy dying over there. And then we have innocence closing up his eyes. Okay? There's another concept that's disappearing from the love. The innocence that came along with the love is closing up the eyes of love. Now, notice just for interest's sake, the use of sibilance, which is the repetition of the S sound in this line over here. So it will be with the C's and the, and the S's over here. Okay? The use of sibilance. Then, as we get into our final couplet, we'll see here that you get that imperative tone and that's changed to a kind of pleading tone here. Pleading with his lover. He says, now if thou wouldst, in other words, if you could please do this, when all have given him over, in other words, when all have given up on this love, in other words, this dying love, from death to life thou mightst him yet recover. In other words, there might be a way, if his lover is able to, to recover and 
re revive that relationship or that love between them. Now, of course, in this resolution here, we see that the speaker's hopes that the relationships are over have completely changed to the opposite. All right, thank you for listening, and please subscribe to the channel for more videos. Goodbye.